This is me. I work for the Government Digital Service uh, as the Head of Accessibility. Um, for those of you who don't know what the GDS is or what we do, uh, we made this thing, uh, which is gov.uk. Uh, gov.uk is the official web presence of Her Majesty's Government in the UK, and it replaced uh, Direct Gov and Business Link, as well as the 24 separate ministerial departments, uh, sites for the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, we've moved roughly 130 of 330 or so, what we call arm's length body websites onto it. So by the time we're done with all of that work, there'll be one publishing portal, even though we're not allowed to use that word anymore, uh, that the UK government publishes all of its content through. Um, we're already closing huge amounts of just random bits of web real estate that the government's had lingering around for years. Uh, I think we've closed about 1,800 websites at this point uh, in the two years that we've been doing this. Um, we are trying to make specific pains not to break the web while we do that. So we redirect the old content to a new home on the National Archives website because we treat even the crap bits of government's old publishing as bits of the history of government communications. Um, so while we're transitioning over to gov.uk, we're deliberately trying to keep some of that old stuff around where it's appropriate uh, or move it onto our new platform. Um, a big part of my job uh, is testing with assistive technologies. I'm a kind of a combination of a developer and accessibility evangelist. Um, I'm also increasingly used to teach development teams across government, like how we want them to build things now. Uh, and a huge part of the work that I do is I test things in the products that our users are going to have to use so we can make sure our services work in them. I test things a lot. Um, my talk's quite different from Mike's. Like, the good thing about my job is my slides are the most boring things on earth. But you should be able to read them from space. Um, <laughs> I don't really do cute pictures. Very rarely you might get the odd screenshot. Most of this talk is just huge words and me waffling. So I'm just going to prepare you. There's definitely no Gordon Gecko. So for those of you who haven't tested with this stuff before, um, the most common ones that we tend to be involved in are uh, screen readers and screen magnifiers. Uh, for people who are either blind or partially sighted. Uh, we use uh, dictation apps for people with mobility issues. Uh, we'll use things like switches fairly infrequently on gov.uk, I'll be honest. Um, but switches that will allow uh, a user with, say, cerebral palsy or motor neuron disease to access your applications and your services with basically one button. Um, iOS 7 in particular has really good switch controls in it. Um, it's really weird, but really awesome to watch someone who can only communicate by like banging their head against the button, like use the services that you've built. Uh, if you ever get the chance like to sit in on a user testing session with one of those users, I highly recommend it, because it will completely change how you view the products you build. Um, if your only reliance on something is to just tab through it endlessly by hitting one button, you'll soon change your idea of what you think is actually important in the things that you build. Um, if we're talking about more common things, uh, like subtitling and captioning for deaf and hard of hearing users, uh, on gov.uk we need to support uh, visiting foreign nationals for things like visa services. So it's not just the deaf that use subtitled services, like they'll quite often turn on subtitles for video content because they can use that to translate the content more easily. Um, we are in the process of setting up uh, video relay systems on gov.uk. Um, it's one of my tasks between now and the end of the year. Uh, VRS allows you to have a direct video conversation with someone who's a native British Sign Language speaker, so like as a video chat. So if you have a deaf user who can't understand the interface for your product, uh, using the video relay allows them to ask questions and 
be told how to navigate the content that you're providing uh, in a way that means you're not necessarily going to have to translate all of that content into British Sign Language, which is quite costly and quite like, time consuming. Um, I think I'm wearing one of the most commonly used assistive technologies on my face, uh, and I'm very warm, so bear with me. Um, you know, all of this stuff that we're doing um, across gov.uk is pretty much all built around the fact that lots of us who work there have been doing this for quite a long time. Um, when I started building websites, I think it was more common that we had nine pixel bitmapped tiny little typefaces um, in gray text on a gray background. That was sort of the default view of the web for most of the 90s, for a good chunk of what I saw. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, A, my eyesight is knackered now, and uh, why gov.uk's default font size is like 19 pixels. Um, we're not necessarily the target demographic for the products that we're building. Uh, all of the citizens in the UK are. So you're going to have people of an incredible range of abilities and disabilities and education levels. Uh, you're going to have lots of people who just aren't familiar with technology, like how you design your applications is going to hugely affect like, how you present them information. Um, there's lots of a crossover between the kinds of assistive technology and the people who use them too. And not all of it is going to be uh, distinctly obvious. Um, you get what Laura wrote, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so it's funny that you mentioned uh, broken wrists and RSI. I've got really bad RSI. Um, I also broke my wrist a couple of years ago because uh, I cycle, came off my bike. Uh, I thought I'd just sprained it. Turns out I'd torn all of the ligaments in the back of my wrist. So I couldn't use my right hand for six months uh, at all. I'm right-handed. That's quite problematic. Um, as a developer and as someone who needed to do this kind of work for a living, I had to spend six months using dictation apps or just typing with my left hand or complaining that my arms hurt a lot. I did a lot of that too. Um, so the most common assistive technologies that we're going to use, uh, screen readers are the easiest ones to start designing and building for. The biggest used one is JAWS. I hate JAWS. It's really expensive. It's quite buggy. Um, something that provides access to like, fundamental parts of people's lives. I think, I don't want to use the word criminal to describe it, being nearly a thousand quid, uh, but I think it's fairly ridiculous that it's that much money. Uh, NVDA is a free screen reader. It's an open source project from two developers in Australia. Uh, it's brilliant, actually, for an open source project. It's, it's quite good. Um, Window Eyes is uh, less capable than JAWS and NVDA, uh, but they've just done a deal with Microsoft to give copies of Window Eyes for free to anyone who has an office license. How about it? Um, VoiceOver and TalkBack are the iOS and Android equivalents. Um, VoiceOver is vastly more capable than TalkBack. Uh, if you do any Android testing, TalkBack will make you want to pull out all your own hair. Um, it's horrible. But opens good. And, yeah. um, JAWS usage uh, is dropping slowly as people realize that NVDA is capable enough. And as more people move on to uh, use VoiceOver especially, uh, the fact that it's built into all Macs and all our iOS devices by default uh, and available for free on any Mac or Apple product means the take up of that is sort of going through the roof. It's still small because we're all Apple users and there's still not that many of us considering. Um, but JAWS and NVDA and VoiceOver are going to be the primary things that you'll need to sort of take into account as you build things for screen readers. Um, there are also screen magnifiers. I'm unlucky enough to have to support Supernova, which isn't great. Uh, Zoom text is the big one. Uh, that's a combination of a screen reader and a screen magnifier and a color overlay. Um, so if you're dyslexic, you can use the one product to do basically everything that you might need for a magnifier and a screen reader as well, uh, which is quite handy. 
but the built-in magnifiers in uh, Windows 7 especially is actually pretty good. Uh, the one in, uh, in Mac OS is great. Uh, there are lots of uh, magnification issues. You can invert color contrast if you have specific problems with contrast. Um, browser zoom is a very different thing than using a screen magnifier. Um, one of the people that I work with in the civil service, uh, her vision is so degenerated at this point that she uses a 32-inch TV as a monitor, and the resolution for that is set to 640 by 480. Um, I think she sees each word generally about this big, and she has to read the words individually to do anything, like whether it's browsing the, any content online, uh, using any application to do any part of her job. Um, she has to sit about a foot away from that, and that's the only way she can read the content. Um, that's pretty harsh to try and design for, like trying to understand how tiring it is to actually use magnification to that sort of level is like quite eye-opening. Uh, I think the WCAG uh, guideline for text resizing says you should aim to make sure you should be able to resize text to 200% without it breaking the layout. 200% um, is probably about 1,000% shy of what she needs to actually be able to function online. Um, you're never going to get to a point where you can design something easily that's going to accommodate that huge like, range of needs. Um, but if you want to find out how differently people with really degenerated eyesight use these things, uh, give them a try in Zoom text or sort of any of the built-in controls. If you are dyslexic or if you have uh, certain visual issues, uh, there are a few different issues that you can use to provide color overlays for the screen. So it lessens the contrast between the foreground and the background. Uh, means that you're actually going to be able to read the content rather than just having it be completely impossible. Um, me, personally, I cannot stand uh, white text on a black background. It makes me nauseous in about 20 seconds if I have to look at any of it. Um, lots of people with vision disorders are going to feel very similarly about the color, the color schemes that you come up with. There's not a lot you can do about that, uh, except put it in front of users and see like which combinations of color schemes that they have the least problems with. Um, if you're talking about colorblind users, um, like Mike said, like a lot of people are red, green, colorblind. Um, if you're only providing information based on color, you're going to instantly lock out about 8% of the male population from being able to easily use your product. It's not ideal if you want to sell them something. So um, in the GDS, we are pretty flexible about how we actually build things, considering we're the government, and this is authoritative. Um, we've got kind of a lower A agile approach to what we build. Uh, we don't really subscribe to any one um, agile philosophy. We've sort of munged bits from all over the place. Um, we have very distinct product phases. Um, so we have a discovery phase followed by an alpha, by a beta, by live. Um, but all of the product teams who are making the individual parts of what makes up gov.uk or what makes up the transactional services that we're redesigning, they own the accessibility of their products. Uh, I'm there to support them and I'm there to give them any help that they need to understand what we actually expect. But it's still up to them to make sure that all of this work is built in at the start of the discovery phase. So when the content people are sitting down working out what they need to say, they take that into account. The designers do, the researchers do. All of the developers know that like, none of this stuff is optional. So for us, a big part of the approach that we came up with when we were set up as a government department is we were going to do things differently. We were going to make everything accessible by default. We were going to actually take the time to make these things as good as we could. Um, so from the beginning of setting up the team that's now 600 plus people, like every single one of the people that's in there working on this thing, regardless of their job, knows that it's a big part of what we expect them to deliver. Um, 
we make them test like early and often from the beginning of the alpha phase. Um, I will help them with internal testing. We'll help them with recruitment so we can hire external agencies who will have their own groups of like disabled users that we can call on if we need to test, say, a tax application with users who are severely dyslexic or dyspraxic. Because getting those numbers right and getting that communication clear could be the difference between somebody becoming bankrupt or going to jail. Like when you're the government, it's not acceptable to allow people to do that. It shouldn't be for anyone, but it's especially important that we get it right. Um, we have a very specific uh, audience for the products we've got, uh, which is any adult in the UK, plus any visiting foreign nationals who need to interact with the state. Um, there's quite a range of abilities in that. Um, so for us, we have to support oh, the main five, yeah, five used screen readers, the top three screen magnifiers, uh, a couple of different color overlay products, the major dictation app. Um, your mileage is really going to vary for a lot of this. <laughs> like, we have to do some pretty gnarly, big, scary stuff, like death and taxes. Um, hopefully, if you're making an iOS game, you don't need to worry about a lot of that stuff to quite the extent that I do. Um, but that said, like, you never really know who your audience is uh, unless you go out and talk to them. Uh, there's no useful like user agent string that gets exposed by a screen reader. So it's my full-time job to work on this stuff for the government. And I have absolutely no idea how many users I have who re rely on the stuff that I've been telling people to build for three years. Uh, we talk to various charities and rights organizations. Uh, I have fairly regular chats with the RNIB. Um, they're very pro the fact that we're putting in as much work that we are, but even they can't tell us how many of their members are having problems with this stuff. Um, the only way that you're going to do it, really, is to have some sort of user research team, or whoever it might be. If you're really unlucky, it'll just be one person. Um, and just go and talk directly to people and find out what your users actually need from your products. Um, the sort of... the other side of that is screen readers aren't the most important thing, depending on your audience. Um, lots of people just assume that you can make it work in a screen reader and then that makes it accessible. Um, they might make up a fairly large proportion of users of uh, assistive technology, but they might not be who are in your user group. Um, that said, if you do build things so that screen readers can use them easily, the core product that you'll end up with at the end of that makes it much easier for you to actually like, provide your content to a wider audience. Um, you know, if you structure your HTML so that the content makes sense legibly, uh, if you structure your headings so they're in a consistent logical order, the screen reader is going to have a lot less work to do to interpret what it is you're actually trying to say. Uh, it's all well and good. Now we have the bright, shiny world of web components. Um, but it's still up to us to make sure, you know, if something looks like a button, it actually acts like a button. And the roles and the states and the properties that should go along with a thing being a button are still sort of there and they're still understood. Um, all of this stuff will help with consistency too. And that is something like, I think when, when we won a Design of the Year award in 2013 for gov.uk, uh, the morning after we did, the Daily Mail had a shit fit about it and said that the award had gone to boring.com because they thought the site was so plain and so tedious and so horrific to look at, they couldn't possibly understood why we'd actually won this very prestigious design award. Um, turns out... Did you not consider that kind of right hand corner of shame for an old story? The site doesn't wear short skirts, so I figured we'd probably be all right. Um, 
the, yeah, I don't know why they hated it quite as vehemently as we did, but it's the Daily Mail, so, you know, take from that what you will. Um, but yeah, the consistency, if you're paying attention to how your HTML is structured, will help your users as they go through the site too. Um, Gov.uk is designed in a very specific, quite boring way for a reason. Like, it should be invisible. Like, most of the stuff that we're building is stuff that people have to interact with once a year at best. Like, they shouldn't have to care about it in the slightest. They should be able to go to the site, instantly understand where they are, instantly trust that it's from the government and it's not some horrific scam site, to go through whatever task it is they want to complete and then go and not think about it for a year. So it's boring for a reason. Um, part of the boredom is if you've done your job right, your users shouldn't really think about it. Um, in terms of how you have to test this stuff, um, it's very much going to depend on who your audience is for your product. Uh, we really don't use very much video content, uh, except in social media. Um, if we did, uh, it would need to be captioned and subtitled. Um, if you've got deaf users, uh, you're going to need to consider whether providing BSL content for them is the right thing to do. Um, you know, you might be on a fancy pants MacBook. Um, I am. Uh, lots of your audience might be on like ancient copies of XP. Uh, users of assistive technology, in, in particular, are really reluctant to upgrade a lot of the time because the stuff they depend on to do their daily tasks, like risking upgrading that and having it not work, is like just gives a lot of people the fear, so they just never attempt to upgrade. So loads of people who we hire to do disabled user testing for us come along with these ancient, like horrible like bricks of computers that just have been online for years and years and years. Most of them run Windows XP. Most of them are on some hellishly old version of Internet Explorer or Firefox. Um, it costs money to up it costs money to upgrade to JAWS. Um, it's not an insignificant amount of money. Uh, if you're on NVDA or you are lucky enough to have a Mac, uh, that pain is sort of lessened, but there's still a big fear in like, what happens if the thing I rely on to communicate with the outside world suddenly breaks because I try to install an update for it. Um, like if you think getting people to upgrade browsers is hard, like trying to get them to upgrade like their screen reader or their screen magnifier is incredibly difficult for very good reasons. Um, if you're talking about how we actually use these technologies to test things, um, the bad news is, is most of it's still manual. Um, there's no easy automated way to make sure that um, a test that you run on a piece of content is going to prove that that content's accessible. Um, you can use the WebAIM toolbar uh, that Mark was talking about. It gets you so far. Uh, it's sort of a useful, quick visual guide. So I use it quite often just to quickly sanity check stuff. Um, for the most part, you're going to have to rely on actually using the products and going through your tasks from end to end. Uh, there's loads of repetition. I know I'm not selling this to you well, by the way. Um, it's like browser testing, but a lot more complex. So um, because of how accessibility APIs provide information to browsers, uh, you are generally only going to have to deal with Firefox and Internet Explorer on Windows or Safari on a Mac, if you're talking about supporting assistive technologies. Um, other browsers just don't communicate well with accessibility APIs, uh, including Chrome. It's a great browser, but uh, it's pretty terrible at actually communicating with voiceover on a Mac. There's one example. Uh, Opera is pretty terrible, if anyone still uses that. No idea why. Um, the way we tend to look at things in uh, the GDS is, as a user of assistive technology, can I go from the start of this transaction to the end of it in the accessibility like product that I need to use from start to finish. Like 
we're not really looking to just see like whether individual pages dotted throughout an app or throughout a website are sort of more compliant than others. Like we can't really stop until it's possible for a JAWS user to go and pay their tax on their own. Like they shouldn't need anyone else's involvement. So our mark of success is, you know, can the users of this stuff go through from end to end without any major obstacles? Like how you get them to that point is going to depend on the kind of things that you're building. Um, for us, most of the publishing that we do through gov.uk is quite informational, but then we have all of the transactional services as well. So we are expecting people to give us information. We're expecting them to log in, to give us like quite complicated bits of information the government needs to know. Um, you have to make sure that they can do that using the tools that they're going to be using. Um, I already talked a little bit about the upgrade fear. Um, they could be on like ages old versions of the assistive technology you need or the browser version that you would like them to be on or the operating system that you want them to be on. Um, you, they could be using a browser that doesn't talk to an accessibility API in the slightest uh, in a version of a screen reader that's five versions behind the current one. Uh, it'll still be your fault when they complain that your site doesn't work. Um, they're difficult to use, too, in a lot of cases. Um, for me, I'm mostly sighted, uh, but I can cheat whenever I want, whenever I'm building something and I have to test it in a screen reader. I can really easily work out what the structure of that page should be by looking at it. Um, I very rarely test with the brightness of my laptop all the way down because I'm lazy uh, and a developer. Um, the learning curve of actually understanding like how screen readers and magnifiers will interact with your content is quite steep. Um, it's not impossible to solve, it just demands sort of dedicated practice and very few people have the patience to learn these things unless they really have to. Like I have to because it's the job that I came up with. Um, if you're just a front end developer or you're a designer or you're a content strategist or whatever it is, like you're not necessarily going to be a specialist in JAWS and how that's going to interact with content. Um, you know, there's a whole different category of bugs and implementation stuff that you have to layer on top of the things you know about your sort of average uh, web developer stack. Um, so you add on the kind of the bugs in the assistive technology and then bugs in implementation of uh, accessibility rules in browsers. And it's like trying to bug fix IE6 all over again. Um, unless your entire team is on board with it too, it's going to be really, really difficult for one person to try and make that much of a difference in your product teams. Um, the way that we've worked at gov.uk is to make sure that it's understood that all of this stuff isn't optional. Like, we're doing this on behalf of all of the sort of citizens of the UK, basically. Like, we can't choose to opt out of any of this. So all of the content designers, all of the delivery managers, all of the developers and designers, they're all invested in making sure these things work. Uh, we run screen reader workshops for the designers and the content team. Uh, for developers to come along and like actually learn how to test their own things in screen readers. Um, it's actually been quite fun. Um, it's always eye-opening, like the first time you try and use something you've built in something like a screen reader. Um, everyone thinks their stuff's really great until you actually try and see how someone else tends to use the things. Um, yeah, the early versions of God.uk very much weren't great, by the way. Um, so I said that I would talk about how I do this stuff too. Um, so I won't just waffle at you endlessly. Um, this is sort of my typical workflow for what I will do when I have to test the product. I'll do a quick quality check on the code just to make sure all the usual suspects have been taken care of. So 
the HTML doesn't suck. You know, it's not missing ARIA landmarks. It's got skip links that work, that the headings are structured well, all the usual best practice stuff. I'll do a quick audit with a few different tools. So I'll check with a color blindness simulator with the color contrast checking tools. Uh, I'll make sure that the color palettes they've sorted out don't actually just bleed into nothing if you've got uh, color blindness or you've got sort of visual issues. Um, we'll check it in uh, tools like the Wave Toolbar or in, uh, there's another one called FireEyes from a company called DQ. It's another sort of automated page by page checker. Um, once all of that's done, that's when we'll start running through the things with the assistive technologies that we have to support. So I'll sit and run through this in uh, a screen reader or a magnifier, or I'll try and use a dictation app to go from start to finish. Um, if we run into any issues, then they get reported back at that point. And because we work in an agile way, uh, all of our sprints tend to be either one or two weeks long. So we've got generally pretty much uh, constant iterative development on all of the issues that we sort of come up with while we're doing this stuff. But because we start really early on in the alpha phase of building these products, we get to the point where by the time it becomes a beta or it be becomes close to being a live service, you should have already reported on most of the major things that will crop up. Like all of the work that you've put in at this point means there shouldn't be any show stopping like horrible things that suddenly like take out your entire app if you have to use it in JAWS. Um, you know, and only when uh, I'm happy that the accessibility of these products is good enough uh, will allow them to launch. Um, having that sign off is really helpful. Um, I'm sort of put into this uh, during our service assessments. So when we rebuild or we redesign a transaction, uh, we have a definite, um, I can't remember how many points are in the, the phase that they have to go through to test compliance for everything. Uh, accessibility is the first thing that we check um, as part of the quality of the actual service. Um, if it's not good enough, we won't allow it to operate. If we have a service that is operating on gov.uk and it drops below a certain level of quality, uh, we have a defined process in place to turn it off. And that goes up all the way to uh, ministers having to apologise in Parliament for why their service isn't online. So there's a definite air of um, like ritual humiliation that gets built into the process, which I think is actually really necessary. Uh, we've had laws that govern how accessible should, things should be uh, since you know, the Disability Discrimination Act. Uh, the Equality Act was released in 2010. That says that we shouldn't be doing this stuff anyway. So having the power to turn things off that aren't good uh, is good. For us, uh, it's completely a quality issue. Like If you're good at being a web professional in 2014, I think accessible development is something that you should care about and you should give a shit about. Um, we've got access to some really awesome tools these days. Um, we can do just about anything we want to online. Um, I think it's probably easier to build things well than we've ever sort of had except for the week after Sir Tim built the thing and all you could do was put a couple of bits of paragraphs of text on a page. Um, since it became an interesting thing to work in, uh, we've got like tons of ways to make this stuff work for as many different people as we can. Um, the web's for everyone, like regardless of ability. Um, so it's up to us to keep it that way. Um, the sort of opposite side to doing that is it's all well and good me testing this stuff uh, and me putting it in front of users who are also sighted and non-disabled. Um, you know, I use ac assistive technology as part of my job. I can't say it because I had a stammer when I was a kid. Um, you know, I'm a pretty good developer, but what I'm not is someone who relies on assistive technology just 
to live and to exist. Like my feedback isn't going to be as detailed or as specific as from someone who actually relies on a screen reader or a magnifier to do anything. Um, so I hired a woman by the name of Leone, who is a W3C invited expert on accessibility. Uh, I really lucked out when she agreed to come and help me build God.ek, because uh, she's brilliant. I've learned more from watching her use things, because uh, she's a blind developer. Um, she's incredible at giving really detailed feedback. Uh, she's a developer first, then she lost her sight. So she gives even more specific feedback than someone who's sort of never seen before would be able to give. Um, as well as Leone, like we've hired lots of different companies that do very specific disabled user testing. You know, there are companies like AbilityNet, there is Nomensa in Bristol, uh, UserVision in Edinburgh. Um, we use a company called DAC, part of the Digital Accessibility Centre in South Wales, and they have a team of uh, disabled staff members of varying degrees who do lots of testing for us across government, and they're incredible. Uh, we have some users with cerebral palsy, some who are hard of hearing or profoundly deaf, uh, some who are blind, some with vision issues, uh, and the feedback that you get from such a broad grouping of people is infinitely better than you will ever get from sitting someone like me down in front of your app and having me test it. Um, so part of the sign-off process for us is before a service goes live, it needs to have been through at least one round of like professional disabled user testing, even after I may have spent months like testing it. Um, not everyone's going to have the budget to be able to do that sort of stuff. Um, I realise like a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about this evening is quite specific to us, um, and quite specific to how we're building gov.uk and the laws that mean we have to do things in a certain way. Um, your mileage is totally going to vary, but there are lots of things that you can take from it in terms of process that makes it easier to like work this sort of level of accessibility into the things that you're having to build, you know, whether it's an iOS app or a web app or whatever it is. Um, I use this quote from Sir Tim all the time. Um, I really like it. You know, don't assume that because you're making a camera app, you won't have blind users who won't use it. Um, don't assume that because you're making an iOS game, you won't have users with cerebral palsy trying to play it with a switch control. You know, if you focus on simplicity and usability, it makes everything better for all of your users, not just your disabled ones. You know, learning what it's like to use the products that you build in something like a screen reader is hard at first, uh, but it will make you a better web professional. Um, it will also improve like your products, uh, your bottom line, and cheesy as it might sound, your users' lives. Um, if you don't know where to start, I'll leave you with these. Um, if you haven't done any sort of accessibility stuff before, uh, Jared at WebAIM is brilliant. The blog post he's got at the top are like 10 super simple things that it will probably take you a combination of about 20 minutes to put into your apps if you don't know like anything about where to start. Um, if you want to start learning JAWS or NVDA or VoiceOver, he has some sort of cheat sheets on there that are uh, really handy. And the accessibility community is really, really friendly. If you need help, there are plenty of people out there who will be more than happy to guide you with any help that you need with this stuff. Um, you know, get involved, get testing, and if you do need any help, uh, just ask. They're quite a friendly bunch. But there you go.